grace, 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 God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within, grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Well, good morning and welcome to Resurrection Oakland. We're so glad that you're joining us this morning as we worship together. We're going to begin with our call to worship this morning. If you've got your worship guide in front of you, you'll see those words at the very top of the page. If you are new to church, you might wonder what exactly is a call to worship. We do this every week to start our service. Uh, Our call to worship simply reminds us that we are not calling God into this time. But God is calling us. We are not inviting him into our presence, but he is inviting us into his presence. God always makes the first move. And that is such good news for us this morning because you may be in your home. You may still be in your PJs. Let's just be honest about that. You may still be waking up. You may be distracted. You may just be beat down from a hard week. You may not be eager to meet with God, but God is eager to meet with you. He is calling you. He's calling us. Let's stand and respond to that call together this morning from Isaiah chapter 55. All who thirst, drink. All All without without money, money, buy buy freely. freely. Let's feast on what is good. Jesus, Jesus, our fount fount of every blessing. Let's be nourished in this truth. Jesus Jesus Christ Christ is is enough. enough. He He alone is worthy of our praise. praise. He He alone alone can satisfy. Amen. Save us for God so loved the world that He gave 
draws the whole world in. So let's declare together that the whole world will know his name. Every tongue shall confess Jesus Christ as Lord. And the earth shall know God's name. And the earth will sing God's praise. All of the earth shall sing the praise. Of our God, of our God. Let us come of one accord to lift up praises to our King. There is splendor and power all around Him. And we will gather all together, every nation, tribe, creed, and color. Let the body come alive. Our Creator be glorified, and the earth shall know God's name, and the earth will sing God's praise, and all of the earth shall sing the praise of our God, of our God. Let us come on one each other and our needs. That's when we gather, there is power all around us. Power to live right, power to be light over our cities and neighbors to speak light. Spirit, give us eyes to see your perfect will for humanity. And the earth shall know God's name. And the earth the earth shall sing the praise of our God, of our God. So heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Won't you heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Heal the land, heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. In Jesus' name, heal the land, meet the need, set the captives free. Heal the land, meet the need. Set the captives free, and the earth shall know God's name, and the earth will sing God's praise, cause all of the earth shall sing the praise of our God, of our God. We'll sing God's praise Cause all of the earth shall sing The praise of our God Of our God I want you to go ahead and take your seats We come now to our time of confession And during this season of Lent, we've been using this time of confession to get very specific 
about the things that we confess. This is one of the ways you know you are really dealing with God, is that you confess not just in generalities, but in particulars. And so we've been confessing things like our pride and our failure to care for the poor, things that the Bible talks a lot about. Today we're going to be confessing our hypocrisy. Uh, The Bible talks a lot about this. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is, it's the gap between what we say we believe and how we actually live. The reality is that this gap exists in every one of our lives, no matter how religious or irreligious you are. And so the question is, how do you deal with the gap in your life? Christianity is counterintuitive in the way that it deals with that gap, really for two reasons. The first is this, is that the more you grow as a Christian, that gap does not get smaller. It actually gets bigger. Because the more you see Jesus, the more you see how unlike Jesus you are. And so you get more honest about the gap. That's the first thing. But here's the second thing. You don't just get more honest, you get more hopeful about the gap. Because what you, the more you understand the gospel, the more you realize that God loves hypocrites. God loves inconsistent people. And he doesn't just love them, but he forgives them. And he doesn't just forgive them, but he is committed to making them whole. To making them new. To making them more like his son in whom there is no gap. In whom there is no hypocrisy. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So in light of all of this, let me invite you to join me in this prayer of confession. You can respond in the all parts. Let's pray together. Our great Redeemer and Savior, we ask that you would rescue us from the sins of our hypocrisy. Save us from the ways our hypocrisy causes us to see ourselves as emotionally, intellectually, morally, or spiritually better than others. Jesus, you warn us that in the same ways we deal judgment upon others, so will we be dealt the same measures of judgment. Deliver us from the ways our hypocrisy causes us to place burdens on others rather than share in their suffering. Father, you warn us that those who exalt themselves in this way will be brought down in their pride and only those who serve you and others will be lifted up. Rescue us from the ways our hypocrisy allows us to comfortably say we know you, even while we entertain drunkenness, division, hatred, selfish ambition, jealousy, and all forms of sexual sin. Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, you warn us that true heirs to your kingdom will be those who bear your fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Forgive us, renew us, and transform our hearts and minds from our self-righteousness. Purge your church of hypocrisy. Lead us to your service which is also the service of others. We ask all these things confident in the name of Jesus who died and rose again for us. Amen. Take just a moment now to make this prayer your own as you confess silently. Let me invite you to lift your heads and to hear these words of assurance from Psalm 103. That God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. 
For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Hallelujah. Let's stand as we respond to this good news in song. Take your seats as you are able. Well, let me welcome you once again to Resurrection Oakland. My name is Brent, and I'm the pastor here. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us. If you are tuning in for the very first time, we especially want to welcome you, whether you are convinced or unconvinced or somewhere in between. Uh, We are seeking to be a community of people who love our neighbors and our city as Jesus has loved us. And if that's a mission that interests you, then we would love to help you get more connected to our church and to our community. The first step you can take to do that is a pretty easy one. You can sign up for our weekly email. We send this out once a week. That will help you stay in the loop with events that are happening in the life of our church. Uh, There are four announcements that I want to bring to your attention today. Here's the first, just a reminder that next Sunday... March 14th at 4 p.m. That is our next in-person communion service. We've done a couple of these. I think this will be our third one. That's next Sunday. You you do need to register for that. Make sure you do that. You can go on our website and do that. Space is limited, but we hope to see you there. Second, kids. Uh, This is an announcement for you. Our Res Kids director, Amanda Collison, is making some very special Res Kits Easter bags with gifts and activities for you. And so if you want one of these, you need to tell your parents to email Miss Amanda at reskids at resoakland.com. She'll have these ready for you. You can pick these up if you're going to be here next Sunday at the communion service. Or if you're not going to be here, she can have those delivered to your own home. Amazing. Amanda, you're doing an incredible job. We're also grateful for you. Third, here is a very big announcement. Um, Exactly one year ago today, this Sunday, uh, we were worshiping together uh, in this sanctuary, and little did we know that that would be our last Sunday morning service for a very, very long time. And I'm excited to tell you this morning that that time is soon coming to an end, that on Sunday, April 4th, that is Easter Sunday, we're going to be relaunching in-person Sunday morning worship services. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Okay, all right, sweet. Um, This is so exciting. 
Let me say, I want to, I want to say a couple things. First, we're going to have two services on Easter Sunday. But just a, a couple things about this. First, some of you cannot attend uh, or you will not feel comfortable yet attending. And, and what we want you to know is that we're going to have a live stream up and running for you, that we are committed to continuing virtual worship in this season because we want everyone to continue to feel like they are part of this church community, even as we begin to regather. And we know that that is going to be a real transition for many people. But second, for those of you who plan on attending, you're going to be getting details in the coming weeks on how to register for those services, as well as how to serve. You know, to, to, to do this again, we're going to have some volunteer needs. And so I would love for you to make sure you're uh, reading these emails that are being sent out, this communications that's being sent out. And if you are able and willing, we would love a helping hand on Sunday mornings as we begin to open these doors again and welcome people back into this building. Uh, and then last is this, is that this morning we have a special guest preacher, Pastor James Westbrook. Uh, pastor James is the pastor of Realm Church. He and his wife, Desiree and their two kids started Realm Church in 2019. James and I are part of a local group of pastors in Oakland who meet together regularly for prayer and encouragement. And uh, he has been a, a source of tremendous encouragement to me, and I'm so excited for you to get to hear him preach the good news of the gospel this morning. Um, with all that being said, now is the time for us to greet one another. So let me just encourage you to take 30 seconds, grab your phone, send a text to someone you know in this church saying that you miss them or that you're praying for them. If you're new, you can drop a comment in our live feed. We'd love to know that you're here, and we'd love to be able to say hello to you. All right, thanks for joining. Let's greet one another now. Jesus asked, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
Well, good morning. So good to be here with you all today. I'm glad to be standing in this place, this beautiful uh, church. Um, I'm uh, grateful to be able to preach uh, with and for my friend, uh, Brent, and I'm so thankful for our relationship. And I want you to know, Resurrection, that every win for Resurrection, I believe, truly is a win for Realm Church. Why? Because we are bound by the same love and by the same heart and by the same hope, which is this hope of the gospel that leads to transformed lives, transformed communities, and then also people get to experience directly the love of God for them. This is our hope as we serve in the same city. And I want to talk more about this idea of love, this God that loves. And last week you would have heard about that. Uh, Brent did such a great job last week in talking about um, wanting to be known as a church that is known for their, their love for people and their love for their community with the question, what if that's what we're known for? Also, this love for God as well. And I want to stay right there because there's something that I don't think that we can talk about enough, and that is the love that is prevenient to the love that we have for others, the love that comes first. What is the motivation of this love? Why do we love the way that we love? Why are we so compelled? And I believe that it's because of the love that God has for us. I believe that we always need to wash this over ourselves over and over again and be baptized in this, this thought that, that God loves us beyond what we can ever hope, think, imagine. And today we see that in our text in Matthew 18. And so let's just talk about that. I want to just jump into this parable that Jesus has to say about the very love of God for us. That's, what I want to do is I want to explain what this is actually saying, and then we're going to apply it to our lives. Our story this morning, it starts off with a question, and Jesus says, what do you think? And maybe that should, that should really trigger us to begin to think about what Jesus is about to say with some type of uh, answer at the end. What do you think? And there's something probably that's really good to note about parables. In every parable, there's always a question being asked and answered. Well, what's the question that Jesus is asking here? Well, first, Jesus introduces a shepherd. Jesus introduces a shepherd, and I want you to know here that, first of all, that this would have been culturally jolting. Why would this be culturally jolting? What is, naked to the, the, uh, what is not naked to the eye, rather? What is hidden here? And, and, and shepherds, during that time, they were looked down upon by the surrounding culture. They were considered foul mouth, immoral, lowly men, and someone not to be acquainted with. One ancient source during this time, so we can really get the picture of what's going on here, says this, in the whole world, you won't find one occupation more despised than that of the shepherd, who all his days walks about with his staff and his pouch. Another source said also to this end, let a man never associate with a wicked person, not even for the purpose of bringing him near to the Torah, that is the law. Here you have this, this cultural climate that, were, that was certainly against shepherds and anyone like the shepherd that said that, hey, do not even associate with this person because somehow by associating with this person, then you corrupt your, you corrupt your own reputation. Jesus uses this culturally jolting, this lowly thing to describe his love, as we're going to see more as we move forward. And even particularly the Pharisees, as you would have once again heard about last week, the Pharisees, they are the, the, the religious elite of the day, and, and they are probably, as Jesus begins to tell more of this story, growing increasingly suspicious of what Jesus, or where Jesus is going with this story. Jesus says that there's a shepherd, and there's a shepherd that they, he has 90, uh, excuse me, he has 100 sheep total. A hundred sheep total. Now, the focus of our story actually is not the 99. It is the one, and we're going to look at that here in a couple of minutes, but he has a hundred sheep. Now, something I want you to understand, if we're going to appreciate what this means and the weight of love that God has for you, if, if you want to really appreciate that, there's something that we need to understand about this context and this culture. See, shepherding jobs 
were a group effort, not an individual effort. The shepherds most likely, especially someone of this esteem, if you own 100 sheep, I don't know anybody who owns sheep right now in this area of the country, but if you own 100 sheep, you gotta, uh, you're, you're pretty wealthy, you're pretty well off. We should assume that this person is really wealthy in this story. And the crowd would have undoubtedly assumed that the wealthy shepherd would have had one of his apprentices or hired hands or a neighboring shepherd watch over the flock as was customary. And so we need to put this picture in our mind if we're going to appreciate what is actually happening here. So I want you to know that, that the story is not so much about a reckless shepherd, though I love this song and we play it in our church every other Sunday. But I want us to appreciate here that it's not about a reckless shepherd, rather a responsible, rescuing one, which brings us to the one sheep. Okay, so what is it about the sheep that we need to understand before we can apply this? It says that there was one sheep that got away. This is the one that strayed. One source tells us that, that any lost sheep, whenever they strayed away, what usually happens is that they will just lay down and they will give up and they will not find their way back to the fold. See, the danger of this is really mounting, and we're really starting to appreciate the picture of what the shepherd is doing when he goes to rescue this sheep in need. See, the strayed sheep is vulnerable and prone to destruction in its season of strain. Okay, and then you have the last movement of this parable, which is going to be the shepherd's response. After we explain this, we can go into the application of what this means for our life. See, you have the shepherd's response. Don't forget that this parable is phrased in a question. And so Jesus starts off with the question of, what do you think? This is to say that the response of the shepherd would have been already assumed by the listeners of his day. Would have been a no-brainer. This is to say that does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? This is a no-brainer. Of course he will leave to go after the sheep that got away, that went astray. And what of the shepherd's emotional state that's important here? Because it says here when it concludes the parable that he's not emotionally indifferent, is he? He's not emotionally indifferent, no. As a matter of fact, he's rejoicing. And he's rejoicing with this appropriate rejoicing that is centered on recovery for that which has been lost. See, the text in, uh, that was read this morning, it says here that and if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. Well, this is not implying that the shepherd loves the one that was lost more than the ones that stayed. It is a particular type of rejoicing. The, the shepherd has a pleasing gaze for those that remained, but he has a rejoicing because of the recovery of that which was lost and now is recovered. Okay, I think we've established well enough the context of this text. Let's see if we can get into some of the application of this text and how might we interpret this text in this parable. Well, let's start off again with the question. Remember, he says, what do you think? What do you think? This parable is set up already for us to begin to appreciate as it pertains to the love of the shepherd is how much more, or from a lesser to a greater standpoint, if a shepherd is willing to do what everyone knows to be a no-brainer, how much more would the Father show his affection for you and for I? Yeah, yeah, now, now we're getting into the, the, the love of, of God and how it applies to us. The lesser is the sheep and the, the greater is the, the human. And as Jesus is explaining the parable that's meant to teach us something about the kingdom of God, meant to teach us something about the heart of the Father and the work of the Messiah, as all parables are meant to do something Along those lines, now we begin to see the love of the Father towards the human towards the person, the shepherd. It is quite interesting to me that as we've already noted that the shepherd was seen as lowly in society, it is quite interesting that Jesus continues to use the lowly things on earth to communicate heavenly truths. Why, Lord, do you use the shepherd? 
the shepherd whom the Pharisees say that you should not even associate with, why use the lowly things? See, though the culture deemed the shepherd to be an unfitting image uh, of someone that is worth being around because whoever you shared your table with and whoever you associated yourself with, well, that somehow reflects you, your value system. Which is why in another telling of this story, in uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, you will see that this is uh, with the social backdrop of Jesus hanging around with, quote-unquote, sinners from what the Pharisees say. And this is not who Jesus came for. See, the shepherd, Jesus is interested not only in who, what we believe is the, the greatest, he's interested in those lowly things. And though the culture deemed the shepherd to be an unfitting image, Though that was certainly the case, we see that Jesus is going to challenge those preconceived cultural notions. And I hope that it begins to wash us and wash over us and convict us and hit us with any bubbles that we have that Jesus is ready to burst regarding who we attach greatness to, who's worth our time. A good principle to keep in note here or keep in mind here is that don't miss the great places God wants to take you through the humble things because you are only eye fixed or eye gazed on the culturally defined great things. That is to say that do not miss what God is saying. And it's typically those themes in our lives that we say that no, this, these are that's too small for me or that's too lowly for me or I typically look past this person or past this demographic and, and no, I don't want to be associated with this or that because... I see myself as something greater. No, don't miss what God is doing and wants to do in your life. As a matter of fact, God adopts this image as a symbol of his love and care for his people. Is that not unlike God? To use those things that we say is lowly in the world, to use those things to communicate his character and his traits, his attributes. In John 10 in 11, he says in the, the gospel, Jesus is the great shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is pictured and he pictures himself as this shepherd for the sheep. Well, that's the shepherd. But then you have this 99 uh, out of the 100, the, the 99. The shepherd leaves the 99. He leaves the 99. And we've already established that. Listen, this is more centered on the restoring shepherd. He's responsible and he leaves him probably most likely in good hands according to cultural records. We know this. However, he goes after the sheep because he knows that the sheep is in danger and he loves the sheep. The 99 and the 1. See, this parable, it teaches us something that is once again antithetical, anti to the value system of this world and of the cultures in which we, we live in, at our jobs, in our political structures, how we establish moral norms. We are constantly asking the question within our own internal system, who's worth listening to? Who should I give my time to? Who's worth paying attention to? See, we will focus often on the 99, nine times out of ten. And here you have Jesus with this parable holding up the one as being legitimately worthy. I mean, in our culture, how often while we're taking it ourselves and our reasoning through our particular value system, through our mind, and when we try to determine if we're going to move closer or towards someone, how, many, how often do we wash it through such reasoning as, I mean, come on, there's only one out of a hundred. There's only one person reporting it. There's only one demographic of people. It's, it's only one neighborhood. It's, it's an insignificant country. Or how many Twitter followers do they have? What's their following? What will the collateral damage be if we do nothing? See, this is not to judge anyone. This is to identify what and how we often or what mechanisms we use to determine if we will focus on the one or not. The point that Jesus is making is, though one seems insignificant, one remains the priority for God's loving rescue. 
One, and, and one to God is, is enough. And, and that means that you are enough to God. You and, and, and me, he, you are enough. As an individual, you are enough to him. And what of the stray? Which inevitably that leads us to the stray. This shows God's love for the individual. And the sheep that strayed from the flock the question that I want to ask us this morning is, have you strayed today? Have you strayed? It, it is an important question. And even more important, have you returned to the fold? Are you lost? That is to say, have you ever even accepted this, this loving invitation to have this personal relationship with a loving God who loves you and who demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet separated from him, demonstrated his love by dying on the cross. This is a part of the demonstration of God's love on the cross, the demonstration of God's love through the gospel. See, let me remind us of the strange sheep. Let me remind us of the condition of the, the strange sheep. We've established that a lost sheep usually lies down and they give up and they don't find their way back to the fold, which mounts the danger and it mounts the necessity for the shepherd to go after the sheep. I say praise the Lord that God comes after the sheep because it is absolutely necessary that God would do such a thing. The strayed sheep is vulnerable and prone to destruction in a season of straying. And maybe I'm talking with, to someone right now. Maybe I'm talking to someone that's felt isolated or even isolated themselves. And, and maybe I'm talking with someone who knows that they need rescue. And they say, Lord, I have somehow drifted away. I need rescue right now. I'm lost in this thing. I'm, I'm lost in my ways. I need rescue. No one knows. I have these shadowy areas in my life. No one knows. I have not lived in complete community, in, in honesty, and I haven't been vulnerable with people. No one knows. Perhaps you have said in our saying with the psalmist this morning, what we find the psalmist saying in Psalm 119, verse 176. Perhaps this is you. The psalmist says that I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. For I do not forget your commandments. Listen to the example that the psalmist gives to all of us, including this preacher. Says, hey, listen, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Lord, I need you to seek after me. Because if you do not, I will stay where I am. I need a power that's able to deliver me from the mess that I've gotten myself in. Can anyone relate to what I'm saying right now? I need your rescuing power, the power of the gospel that makes me alive. I need to be freed from these chains that I often find myself wrapping myself in. And there's freedom in this. That's what the, the word says. The gospel sets us free. And whom that the Lord sets free is free indeed. And we were saved for freedom's sake. And that's a freedom that's bound by God's loving law. But he says that, listen, I, I need you, Lord. I need you to rescue me. And we sometimes stray. And we need to hear that. Because we stray from lush grass to barren fields because of the sins in our hearts. We all know those seasons. We've all been there. And it's important to know the heart of the Father with this as we talk about God's love and as we get ready to conclude what this and where this parable is pointing us. See, I think that often we can probably relate to what I'm saying. When we go astray, I think we can probably look at this timeline and say, yeah, yeah, pastor, preach, I, I, I've been there. Mm -hmm. What's the timeline that we often see? We, we wander from, from God and we, we're, we're, we're drawn away by something in life that we know is not pleasing to God, not helpful to our own health and not, doesn't actually lead to lasting joy and to flourishing. We're, we're, we're drawn away by things, and we wander from God, and, and we stay away because we believe ourselves to be unworthy. 
Right? That's when the, the guilt and the shame. Shame has to do with, I feel that I am, there's something wrong with me. And guilt has to do with, I did something wrong. And, and so we end up staying away because of toxic shame in our lives. Then we stay out a little longer. We, we can't fake it that long. You know, the whole putting on the face, making sure that people know that we are nice and good and religious or we're good moral people. After that, we, after we fall and succumb to the weight of that pressure that we put on ourselves to wear masks instead of being open and honest and free, what happens is then we wander a little further away from the fold. We stop going to, to church or to community group or being around people that we know will speak the words of God in our life. We stay longer. Then what, we, what do we do? We lay down as the sheep. We give up and we don't find our way back to the fold. We even begin to even question things like faith and is it worth it? God becomes the God who understands instead of the God who wants so much more from and for my life and our lives. See, the gospel is about limitless grace and limitless demand. That means that God lavishes us with grace and then in return, we give him everything as God requires everything from us, and he's worth it. But this idea of limitless grace is something that is undoing to us because we say that, Lord, how can you love us so much? And he certainly does. Let's conclude our time even with this idea of the rescue of the shepherd. See, the shepherd who has 200 sheep, one got away. The, the 99 they're taking care of, praise the Lord, but he's going to go after that one that went astray and he's going to rescue. How many times do we believe, this is where I, we need to bring this home here, how many times, brother and sister, friend, skeptic, whatever, wherever you're coming from, if you're on the fence of Christianity, trying to figure out if this is going to work, I want you to listen to what the gospel says. Listen, how many times do we assume that that our, our, our sin, and, and when we stray away, that somehow that God is frowning at us when we've strayed from Him. He's frowning at us, and those condemning divine eyes are ever upon us. They, they're burned into the amygdala of our brains, and they drive what we do. See, when we talk about the love of God and even wanting to be known for our love, it cannot be motivated by something that is not true in the gospel. See, the picture that we have here is not that of a, con of, of a God with condemning eyes. Does God rebuke? Does God discipline? Yes, because a loving Father disciplines. However, He does not condemn those that have given their life to Him. It's loving eyes here and it's, and it's open arms here and listen to God's heart for the sheep. You may be surprised as we conclude our time that the understanding of the Old Testament is critical in understanding many parables, including this one. See, Jesus is actually giving hint and he's quoting from, implicitly, he's quoting from Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 5 through 6. Listen to what the prophet says in chapter 36 when he's giving words of encouragement to the scattered sheep of Israel during their time of discipline and during the times where outside agents were coming to bring warfare against Israel. Listen to what he says. He says, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered over all the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. This was the condition that the sheep were in. The people, the covenantal people of God, the, the people of Israel in the Old Testament when they were faithful, uh, facing warfare. See, this story 
that, that, that Jesus is alluding to and Ezekiel is showing God's attitude towards recovering the lost. And what Jesus is saying, brothers and sisters, listener, friend, wherever you find yourself at this morning, Jesus is saying here that he's doing the work of Ezekiel chapter 36 and being the shepherd with this, this gathering heart and this rescuing heart for the lost sheep and for the straying sheep. This is who Jesus is saying. He is the great shepherd. And he's a great shepherd even for our lives. This parable is about God's association with the wandering. And, and the response here is, listen, God rejoices. He's, he smiles. He, he rejoices. And because of the, this rescuing God, his rescue leads to rejoicing. That's the heart of God here. He says in verse 13 and 14, And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. I hope this morning you see God's love for you. And whatever that means for you this morning, someone needs to hear that God loves you with a love that you can not imagine. His love and the tank and the well of his love is deeper than any sin in our hearts. And maybe it's time simply for you to have a different story where you don't wander and stay away. You come and you run to the loving arms of God. And I want you to know also that if you are standing, and like I said, on the fence of Christianity, and you don't know whether or not you want to believe this thing, I want you to know that God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not die but have everlasting life. God loves you, and it's not your religion that he wants. He wants you. He loves you with this limitless grace, and then we give him everything. And so hopefully that's a love that motivates your mission. Hopefully that's a love that we say that, love, Lord, you love me first, and I love you, and I'm willing to live on mission and see lives transformed and see communities transformed and see justice done in the world because of your love for me, and I can't keep it to myself. Let me pray for your encouragement to that end. Father, I want to pray right now for my brothers and sisters doing work right here in Oakland and in the Bay region. I pray right now, Lord, for resurrection, God, that, that they are just that. They are this display of hope in the world and of resurrection hope in the world and that is motivated by this love that is contagious and this love that is believed and that is a love that says that, Lord, you love us so much that even when we wonder, you come after us, a rescuing love. And artistically, some may even call it a reckless love. But we know that it is a responsible, loving love. Lord, may that be ever true for the continued work right here at Resurrection. Lord, we love you. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. All right, thank you, Pastor James. And now I'd like to invite you all to stand as you're able and we are going to enter a time where we respond to what we have heard, the good news we've heard um, in our gifts, in our offerings, and in our song. Took a breath, you breathe. 
My name is Malachi Jackson, and I'm so happy to be here with you. Please join me as we pray for our city. God, we come thanking you. God, we thank you for the gift of who you are. God, we come thanking you for the gift of your presence. God, we come thanking you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, my prayer for this church, for this community, is that we would allow you to work in us and through us 
for the good of your glory, for the good of your kingdom, for the good of your people. God, it says in your word that you draw near to the brokenhearted, to those who are suffering, God. So my prayer for all those in this church, in our communities and in our world, for all of those that are suffering, that are broken, that are handling difficult challenges, whether they are emotional, spiritual, or financial, God, my prayer is that you would draw near unto them. God, and I pray that this community, this church would partner with you, that we would seek to lift up one another, that we would seek to love each other, that we would seek to love your kingdom as you do. God, I pray for peace, for love, and for joy to reign in the hearts of your people in this church and throughout the church all over the world. God, I pray that we will continue to be living witnesses to your power and your presence today, tomorrow, and forever. All of these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to sing this prayer with me. Spirit, pour out and flood this city. Heaven, come down and shake the wall. Feel us, Lord, the world is waiting. Father, let your kingdom come. Spirit, pour out. Spirit, pour out and flood this city. Heaven, come down and shake the walls. Feel us, Lord, the world is waiting. Father, let your kingdom come. You are the God who builds. You are the one who saves. You are the God who prospers. Evil has no claim. You are the God who builds. You are the one who saves. You are the God who prospers. Fervently we pray. You are the God who builds. You are the one who saves. You are the God who prospers. Evil has no claim. You are the God who builds. You are the one who saves. You are the God who prospers. Fervently we pray. Please join me now in our sending prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're so glad that you joined us this week to worship. We hope that you'll join us next Sunday at 10 a.m. But until then, let me invite you to lift your hands and receive God's blessing on your life. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
May the love of God the Father and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and tomorrow and forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.